One of the things that I hear people often say is they use ad, uh, the term Africa in sort of a broad sense. Hey, have you been to Africa? How many of you have been to Africa? And I think sometimes we in America uh, have difficulty really grasping the size of the African continent. So I wanted to put a, uh, an image up on the screen so you can just see a little bit about how big the African continent is. And I know you probably can't make everything out perfectly, but if you look on the upper left side, you see the, the dark brown area, that's the United States fitting into Africa. And that red area, that's China fitting into Africa. Uh, just above that and to the right, that orange area, that is India. And you can see above India, that blue area, that's Eastern Europe. And you can see France, and you can see Japan down in the bottom, and you can see the United Kingdom in the blue, uh, 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 large Madagascar off to the right, and France, and Spain, and, and, and Italy, the, the green boot uh, up there. It's amazing how vast the African continent really is. And the place that we're going uh, and the place that we've been is Tanzania. And so that you can get a little grasp of the scope of how big Tanzania is, if, and go ahead and put up the map of Tanzania so everybody can kind of see. It's just a small portion there of Africa. But so you can grasp that. Imagine you were in western Nebraska, about Sydney, Nebraska, right on the far western border. And you got on Interstate 80. And you drove on Interstate 80 and started going eastward. You drove through the entire state of Nebraska. How many of you besides me have made that drive before? That's a lot of ground to cover. But then you kept on going and you went into Iowa. Let's add up all the square miles of the state of Nebraska. And then you go into Iowa. Let's add all the square miles of the entire state of Iowa. And you kept going eastward. And let's say you went to the next state, which is Illinois. And you added up all the square miles of Illinois. And you kept going east, and you added up all the square miles of the next state, which is Indiana, you know, your geography. And then you kept going eastward, and you added up all the square miles of Ohio. Yeah. And you kept going eastward, you added all the square miles of Pennsylvania. And you kept going eastward, and you'd get into New Jersey. You added up all the square miles of New Jersey. And then, just for fun, you added the square miles of Indiana one more time. You added all the square miles of all of those states up together. You still wouldn't quite reach the size of Tanzania. Tanzania is a really big place. In Tanzania, there are two million orphans. And the area that that we're going to, it's called the, Magoro, the Morogoro, I mispronounced on the video, it's called the Morogoro region. The Morogoro region is only about 139 square miles, almost the same size as the footprint of Omaha. But in the Morogoro region or municipality, there are 200,000 orphans. Imagine if there were 200,000 orphans in Omaha. The area that we're going to, this Nkambarani, this village, it's a, it's a small village. It only has about 5,800 inhabitants, but it has 243 orphans. So we are looking to further this relationship that we already started with this orphanage in 2014. And we're continuing it on and building it and establishing and, and growing something that that's already begun and it's started to sprout and we know the children and the leaders, the house parents, the missionaries and the church that really got this uh, uh, orphanage going uh, was started by a man named Barnabas Ntokumbali. I'm getting good at these words that start with the letter M. And Barnabas spoke for us here just uh, uh, two or three years ago. Wonderful man of God. And his church launched this, has been raising the resources to get the orphanage going. It, it pays the ongoing uh, needs of staffing. But even with that, it takes partners that will come alongside and help. And I wonder if we could help carry some of the load and be a blessing to that community of Nkambarani. So 
Over the next few weeks, we're launching this thing we're calling Kingdom Christmas. We're calling it Kingdom Christmas because we want to approach Christmas with a different sort of a heart, a larger view that sees not just my four and no more, but really looks at the kingdom of God as a whole. And we're going to be looking at this passage in John chapter 4 where Jesus meets a woman at a well. And in John chapter 4, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to a place and Jacob's well was there and Jesus sat down because he was tired and, and he was uh, thirsty from the journey and a woman came to draw water and Jesus asks a really poignant question. He says, will you give me a drink? You ever imagine Jesus wanting a drink of water? Jesus says, will you give me a drink? I hope everybody by now has a, one of these little eight-ounce bottles of water with our little Kingdom Christmas logo on it. If you have it, why don't you take a moment and unscrew the lid and take a moment, lift it up, and take a drink of water. I didn't do that for you, I really did it for me. It just gave me a moment to get a drink. We are really blessed with water in our country. We have no idea how blessed we are with water. Water is really an amazing but essential compound. If we have a lack of water, we start having memory loss and we can start becoming fuzzy and it's so needed for our health. I drink water, a lot of it, probably more than most of the people listening today. I, I drink about seven or more uh, regular half liter bottles of water every day. First thing I do when I wake up, last thing I do before I fall asleep. I drink it because of my health, but I drink it for a larger reason than that. It's because I can. Right. It's readily available. There's an abundant amount of it. It's not too expensive unless you're going in Disneyland. And I live in America. But you know, in other places, water isn't quite as available. In other places, such as this village of Mkambarani, water is very difficult to find. They can sometimes go anywhere between seven and ten days without having water. Oh, by the way, do you know in the time it took you to unscrew the lid, lift the bottle to your mouth, take a drink, and put it down, a child somewhere in the world died because of a lack of having safe drinking water? Seventy percent of my brain is water. But eighty percent of the health issues in the world are a result of a lack of safe drinking water. In America, we, we use up and waste a lot of water. The EPA estimates that we, in America, waste about a trillion gallons of water a year. A trillion is such a big number, we can't even really comprehend it. It's about uh, 40 million swimming pools, 24 billion bathtubs, it's a lot of water, and I waste water. I, was, I turned the water on, waited for it to get warm last night, uh, and I was going to uh, wash my hands, and I went in the other room. I forgot about it for a minute. I came back, heard the water running. I thought, oh, I'll get to it in just a second. I've got to do this first. I don't know. A lot of us do that. Am I the only one? You know, we have leaky faucets. Do you know if you have a toilet that's continuously running, it can, it can lose between 1,000 and 4,000 gallons a day. We, just, we have so much of it, we just don't realize. And that isn't to make us feel bad, but it's to make us aware of what a blessing we have in America. That, that I, for one, I think I take it for granted. Last Sunday morning, it was raining, you know, and as I was uh, driving here to the church, I going along the road, I turn past Bellevue University and my windshield wipers are going back and forth because it's raining and I notice their sprinkler system was on in the middle of the rain. How many of us, we have enough water to water 
water our yards and grow green weeds. <laughs> and how many of us that have sprinkler systems, it goes off onto the pavement and you lose a lot of water too. What a blessing water is. And Jesus came up to this woman and he said, will you give me a drink? So we're calling it Kingdom Christmas. What exactly would a Kingdom Christmas look like? Well, I said the people that we want to have, uh, have, a, have provide a blessing for at Christmas are these people in Tanzania, this small little orphanage. It's an orphanage that's a distinctly Christian orphanage. The children are learning about Jesus and they're it's not made for the people within the church, it's made for orphans within the community. And they're taken care of, and they're receiving the basic things they need for life. But if you were to ask these children what they need, more than anything else, more than electricity or anything else, they would tell you it's water. Right now, the only way that they can have water is they have it delivered on a truck when, when the truck is reliable to, uh, to bring it there. But even when the truck brings the water, it goes into these large containers that aren't necessarily healthy, so they still have to boil, boil the water, and they don't have any kind of running water. They don't have a way to flush away uh, human waste or any of those kinds of things. What if we were to partner with them in helping them enjoy Maybe not in the quantity that we enjoy it, but enjoy something as basic and simple as water. What if God were to do something through us as a church to help these poor, weak, helpless, defenseless orphans have something? They're in a, in a community that is predominantly Muslim. Just imagine what it would be like if, if we as a church were to provide a well for them, a, a solar-powered well and purification system that would, that would provide water right for them, right in the middle of their little orphanage plot of land. And, and the Muslims and the pagans and the animists and, and others in the community would see that, why do these, why do these poor, defenseless orphans have this and then the Christians, if they freely in the orphanage, made it available to everyone in the community. Yeah. So that they are providing not just physical water, but living water yeah. to people who don't know Christ. What an incredible opportunity we have before us. So what we're doing is we're challenging everyone who's a part of the church. And I know it sounds crazy to do over feed the multitudes time and right before Christmas, but we really feel like this is something the Holy Spirit has led us towards. We're going to challenge everyone in the church to think about how you might be able to give towards an orphanage in a village that you've probably never been to before, to children you will possibly never meet, but for the things that would work eternally in the kingdom. Jesus is saying, will you give me a drink? You know, the scripture says in James 1.27 that pure and genuine religion before God our Father is, is to start with caring for orphans. In Proverbs, it says, uh, uh, chapter 21, verse 13, it says, if a man shuts his ears to the, to the cry of the poor, he too will cry and not be answered or not be heard. I want to be one who has my ears open. And so what I'm doing is... Even as I've been processing this whole idea, uh, this whole dream of being able to bless this community, what I'm doing is I'm saying, God, would you do a work inside my heart? Would, would you do something inside of me that, that is kingdom-oriented? So this morning I want to draw your attention to a simple verse. It's in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. This simple verse is one you may have heard before. If not, I'll share it with you. Now would be a good time for all of us also to take a drink so that I can take a drink. In this verse, Jesus has been challenging the people who are listening to, to think about how they treat his ambassadors who would go out and share his good news. And he talks about receiving a prophet, and now he's talking about just receiving any 
of these that are following him. And Jesus says this. He says, if any one of you gives even a cup, that would be about this much water, even a cup of cold water to one of these because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Even a cup of cold water. One of my favorite stories of the power of cold water involves a a man who went to visit his elderly father in the backwoods of Kentucky in a very rural area. He went and he visited his father and while he was there uh, his father had cooked uh, breakfast for them and it was bacon and eggs and and the the man said grandfather there's uh, I said father earlier grandfather he said grandfather there's it looks like a film on the plate and and the grandfather said, he said, well, I'm telling you that's as clean as cold water can get them. And, and then later on that day, they were having lunch, and the young man said again, Grandfather, there's a film on this plate. And grandfather put his fist down, and he said, I'm telling you that's as clean as cold water can get them. And later on that night, as, as he was getting ready to go out for the evening, the young man said, Grandfather, your dog's blocking the door. He's growling. He won't let me out. And the grandfather says, Cold water, get out of the way of the door. One person's view of cold water is not the same as another. Jesus said, if anyone gives, let's highlight the word give. If you have a Bible, I'd say circle the word gives in your Bible right there. Notice if he says anyone gives, that means it applies to all of us. If anyone gives, when we give, it's something we do from the heart. It's something we do freely. It's something we do out of generosity. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water. The next word I want you to highlight or circle in your Bible, if, you, if your uh, Bible uh, program or app lets you do this, I would highlight this word. And it's the word water. If anyone gives even a cup of water. And he says cold water. Now, I want you to think for a moment when it says cold water because in most cases a person would have to, go, have to walk as much as two kilometers to get to a place where they'd in fact find a well, and a well would go deep enough to get cold water. Frequently what would happen is somebody would take a, a large jar and they would go to the well and they would ha have, have it filled up and then they would bring it away from the well and that would last them anywhere between one and four days. So Jesus is saying, if anyone of you would give a cup of cold water, what he's saying is it would cost you, it would cause you to sacrifice you would have to go a distance. You'd have to go all the way to the well and get water from down deep in the well and it'd be brought up and that you would come all the way that distance to give a cup of cold water. And then he says, I want you to give it to little ones. I want you to circle where it says little ones. Little ones. What does he mean by little ones? What he means by little ones is those who are those who are unable to care for it and gather it themselves. It could mean the disciples. It could mean those who are weak. It could mean those who are poor because Jesus cares for all of these. Jesus cares for uh, and has compassion for all these. And I want my heart to have a similar kind of compassion. And you might say, well, there's so many needs in the world and that's such a small little small little pinpoint of all the needs and, and with Africa being so huge and there being so many orphans, why this one? And I'm saying because Jesus is the kind that always goes after the one. Amen. He'll even leave the 99 to go after the one. That's the very heart of Jesus. Imagine this. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water there's a verse in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. It says, a generous man will prosper. And it says, he that waters others will be watered himself in the New American Standard. Some of your versions might say refreshes others. But the word there literally means to soak, to satisfy, or to saturate. I wonder if this would tie in somehow with the vision God's given us to saturate our city and our world 
with the heart of God. I wonder if somehow this ties into the greater things that God has for us, things that we hadn't planned on before. I believe the greater thing that we might do even this year is not merely about gathering the $35,000 we need to gather uh, by, uh, and our target date is December 20. It's much larger than that. But I know in my family it's going to mean we're going to, we're going to gather together and talk about what we might do differently. Maybe we won't be spending so much money on Black Friday and maybe we'll be investing more in eternity for what God wants to do in Mkambarani through Kingdom Christmas. And I'm just saying, God, would you capture my heart in the midst of all this? Jesus said, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I like that because he is my disciple because giving to those in need, that's what his disciples do. They just do it. They give. They don't have to, uh, have to be primed like a pump to give. God's disciples, they just give. It's natural. We give. That's what we do. And so we don't say, well, that's crazy to do over the Christmas holiday. We say, God, how do you want to do it? Tell us what you want us to do. We want to be a part of that. And Jesus says this, in, in this at the end of this verse, he says, I tell you the truth, he will certainly, certainly not lose his reward. I would circle the word reward or, or highlight it in your Bible. Because, first of all, that means that God's promising rewards for those who give. And he also means that it's possible to lose a reward. Imagine this. Over the life of your service, you, uh, of, your, of your Christian walk, you've, you've given, and, and then somewhere along the line, you, you stopped caring deeply in your heart. And maybe you became a little prideful. Maybe you became a little fearful. And you started to clench your fist and hold on a little tightly. And maybe in the midst of that, you lost your sense of deep moving compassion for the needs of others. Jesus is simply saying, will you give me a drink? How will I account for my life before the Lord? on the day that he hands out the rewards. Man, life is flying by, isn't it? How many of us can believe that it's almost Christmas time already? This is Feed the Multitudes week. What happened? It all went by so fast. Almost everybody I know can't believe that they're at where they are in their life right now. It's flying by. How much am I willing to risk by not giving lavishly. Jesus is saying, will you give me a drink? Man, my desire is that my heart would open up even more to participate in what Jesus is doing. You know what Jesus uh, did? Not only in John 4 did he say, will you give me a drink? And worship team, you can come. Not only in, uh, did Jesus say, will, give, will you give me a drink? But you know where else he said that? When he was dying on the cross for your sins and mine, tells us about it in John chapter 19 verse 28. Here's Jesus dying for our sins and he's uh, uh, essentially uttering the same expression that he did earlier. He's saying, I'm thirsty, will you give me a drink? And in Matthew chapter 25 Jesus is talking about the end of the age. And he's talking about heaven and he's saying you know I was I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger, invited me in. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. And they'll say, hey, when did we do that, Lord? And he said, whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. Jesus saying, will you give me a drink? Whatever we do to the least of these, we're doing to Jesus. When we give to the orphans, we're giving to Jesus. What an incredible opportunity. Let's be a part of giving him a drink. 
I know somebody might say, well, there's too many other things. There's feed the multitudes. You can't do it all. Ah, we can't do it all. But it's amazing what God can do if we'll open our heart and say, God, do an incredible kingdom work inside of us this year. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are so blessed with water. Thank you, God, that your, your kingdom is rich and abundant. Thank you, God, that you have even given us the opportunity to give generously to people in our city, like this week. And you've given us the opportunity to give generously to people throughout our world, to saturate. God, we want to do just that. Take this word this morning. Remind us that you love us to give you something to drink. And let our hearts be open and joyful and generous in the days ahead. God, I pray for all that you want to do this week in our Feed the Multitudes outreach. Lord, we want to make it not about us, but all about you. God, let our hearts be freely giving because freely we have received indeed. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.